Good afternoon. Welcome to our panel discussion. My name is Sunil Shah, and I'm an engineering manager within the Compute Infra team at Airbnb. We manage all the Kubernetes infrastructure at Airbnb. And at Airbnb, we've been running all of our production web services on Kubernetes since 2019. We're excited to discuss on-call best practices for Kubernetes with you today. Each of the panelists here operate Kubernetes at high scale in production at large technology companies. Let's start with a brief introduction by each panelist. Hi, I'm uh, Ashley Catello. I am the tech lead of Lyft's application runtime organization, which comprises kind of your foundational infrastructure components, such as compute networking and data stores. I've been at Lyft for five years, um, and Lyft has been running Kubernetes in production at scale for around three years now. Our workloads are ranging everywhere from stateless services, stateful services, ML training on GPUs, um, et cetera. Hi, everyone. My name is Fabio Kuhn. Um, I've been at Netflix for almost six years now. I am a staff engineer at the um, compute team at Netflix. Titus is our container platform, um, and it's been running, it predates me, so it's been around seven years around, and it was built on top of Mesos before. Um, we ran, we migrated the guts of Titus to Kubernetes around three years ago, um, mostly with, not mostly, without people even noticing. So. It was a big thing for us, move from Mesos to Kubernetes, uh, been running Kubernetes since then. Um, Tidus is running a variety of all the workloads at Netflix, ranging from stateless web services, stateful services, real stream, real, uh, real time data infrastructure pipelines, and machine learning workloads, encoding as well. Hello, I'm Madhu. I'm a software engineer and tech lead for the orchestration team at Robinhood. Uh, my team is responsible for running the compute platform for all of Robinhood. We have been on Kubernetes for a little over three years now. And, but I have been at Robinhood for only a little over a year now. Before Robinhood, I worked at Google for about eight years, of which I spent a little over half of the time working on Kubernetes itself and, and those related technologies. Hi, uh, my name is Ramya. I'm an SRE embedded with a compute infra team. I've been here for around five years. Uh, I've been managing Kubernetes uh, for around four years since its inception uh, within Airbnb. Um, uh, my team is responsible for Kubernetes upgrades, etcd upgrade, managing autoscaling groups, uh, managing cluster autoscaler, uh, certificate management, and cryo, and uh, uh, the whole nine yards. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure meeting you all. So let's uh, let's start with a brief overview of how OnCall operates at each organization. Um, specifically, what is the split of responsibilities between teams using Kubernetes and your team operating Kubernetes? And how do you organize your OnCall rotation within your team? Um, let's start with Fabio. Titus is completely abstract in Kubernetes away from our users. Um, we don't expose a Kubernetes API internally at Netflix today. Uh, and we package Kubernetes as a product. So we offer a... Um, job and tasks based API so people can run workloads based on that API and we fully own that service we operate it as a product as internal product uh, so we have a clear interface clear contract between what's who's using uh, what we offer and they don't know about Kubernetes it's an implementation detail from for them um, we have full control over how we use Kubernetes so any any problems any issues it's completely in our um, scope and our own calls right now organized in week-long shifts we have primary and a secondary rotation. Sec secondary falls primary. So each person is roughly two weeks on call. First is secondary, then primary. Um, and we have a single pool for everything, uh, all the all aspects of the container platform, all aspects of title. So it's all people are on call for everything. Today, it's a single, two big, large rotations, primary, secondary. And we tried splitting in the past. Um, we now combined and moving back and forth. It's a constant trade-off for us on creating silos or, or managing siloing inside our team and managing also the surface area as we combine. There's a lot more to cover. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we got it right yet, but we've been iterating back and forth. Um, and we're likely to continue iterating. We're trying breaking up a little bit again, trying to combine a little bit more. We'll, we'll keep iterating on this. Thank you, Fabio. Um, Madhu, do you want to go next? Our approach is slightly different to this. Uh, we have a platform experience team that's different from my team that provides higher level abstractions on top of native Kubernetes APIs. And we call those APIs archetypes, but those APIs are also essentially just CRD. So it's very much a native Kubernetes experience. Platform experience team is also responsible for providing a UI. All services at Robinhood are expected to use those APIs and UI. Orchestration provides the foundational compute platform for the platform experience team and the layers above. Um, so when it comes to orchestration itself, orchestration is the team that's responsible, which is my team, 
It's the team that's responsible for managing the life cycle of Kubernetes clusters and any other underlying AWS infrastructure. Uh, we are a full AWS shop right now. All of this is in addition to developing and shipping in-house infrastructure software on top of Kubernetes. So in a sense, my team orchestration builds and operates an internal distribution of Kubernetes that supports the company's growing needs. So during instance, we call them SAVs for service events like many other companies in the industry. Uh, service teams make a quick determination as to whether the problem is at the application level or at the infrastructure level. Uh, if they determine that if it's an infrastructure problem, they page the appropriate infrastructure teams on call. They can go into this tool called as the Go Services tool, where they can look up the mapping between infrastructure services and on-call aliases, and then page that on-call alias. For example, platform experience on-call is paged if the issue is an archetype, orchestration on-call is paged if you think it's a Kubernetes level problem. Uh, but unfortunately, it's really hard for application or service teams to determine that. So orchestration is sometimes considered a catch-all and we get a lot of pages. Orchestration itself is divided into three teams, container orchestration, compute infrastructure management, and cloud infrastructure. And the appropriate team is engaged based on the problem type. And sometimes there is a human router involved if the teams cannot determine which exact team the uh, pages, pages should go to. Orchestration incident response is a 24 cross seven three day rotation is a single rotation. We have experimented with various durations, but this has worked well for us. There's also a separate business as only three day service desk rotation. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a bit of a theme here, which is, um, you know, for, for each of your companies, you've abstracted away how uh, users can actually access Kubernetes, which I think is um, definitely something we've we've considered to Airbnb. Um, Ashley, I'd love to hear about your experience. Yeah, so at Lyft, we also go the abstraction route. I think we are what I call aspirationally serverless, where uh, we're not quite there yet, but uh, we do aim on the infrastructure side to abstract away implementation details of our infrastructure from service owners. And so service owners that are running on top of our Kubernetes platform, for the most part, are responsible for just defining their own business logic-based SLAs and, and getting paged based on that. The compute team is then responsible for the overall health of the Kubernetes infrastructure. So that's Kubernetes itself, um, EC2, and anything that is running on that, on that layer. And then we have a, another team called Control Systems that operates the operators that generate objects for service, service owners um, that kind of manages the platform layer that the service owners interact with. There is a bit of a gray area, um, and like, I think this is the area where it becomes difficult in that kind of breakdown doesn't really work anymore, which is operator owners. We do have a few teams that deploy and manage custom operators that are not within infrastructure at Lyft. And the way that we've tried to wrangle this is that we try to spell out in advance an explicit contract and escalation policy for these teams that kind of show that, you know, their level, the first level of support where, you know, issues from their customers come in, they triage them um, via the platform. And then if it, it can be proven to be an issue with infrastructure layer below that, then they should escalate and involve the compute on call. Thanks, Ashley. Um, it sounds like there's definitely a theme here of kind of um, escalation between teams, depending on where we think the issue might actually be. And, and that's definitely something that seems a little bit messy with, uh, you know, with Kubernetes in general, just because the surface area is so large. Um, Ramya, um, tell us about your experience at Airbnb. Yeah. Uh, we also have a similar team. We have something called One Touch API, which is an internal tool that we have built that helps the product teams build services upon Kubernetes. They just abstract away all the YAML files that need to get applied to build, build and deploy services into Kubernetes. Uh, uh, there is a lot of, uh, we maintain a clear API and there are still a lot of questions from our product teams about these APIs. So to help them, we have office hours, uh, a weekly office hour rotation, we have a stack overflow like uh, implement a stack overflow implementation where people ask questions and then get answered. And we have a good developer power portal for our documentation that they are expected to refer before asking all questions everywhere else. We also have clear expectations. All modes are ephemeral. Everything will go away 14 days irrespective of uh, whether you're stateful or stateless. And uh, teams are expected to handle these uh, ha handle these rotations gracefully and not have incidents every time we rotate instances. We also have high touch customers who have CRDs running and we isolate them into separate cluster because one CRD should not affect any of our other customers. Uh, so uh, high touch customers get, get their own special clusters. Uh, uh, within the Kubernetes, Kubernetes is a huge, infra, a lot, huge infrastructure, a lot, huge surface area. So we are divided, broadly divided them into three pods, though the team members shift across. We have a scheduling pod, we have a foundation pod, and we have a one touch pod that 
builds the APIs that our customers use. Uh, the on call is, as everyone said, is shared between a primary, uh, is shared across all these pods, and there is a primary on call and a secondary on call where the secondary acts like a fallback to the primary. Thanks, Ramya. Cool. So yeah, we've touched a bit upon um, you know how the on call rotations roughly look and how the split of responsibilities is. Um, once you've got on call up and running, how how do you all um, you know facilitate the sharing of state and knowledge between members of the on call rotation? For example, there may be a production issue that carries over from one week to the next. How do members of the rotation communicate context with each other? Let's start with Madhu. There is an orchestration on call Slack channel where quick handoff notes are passed from the outgoing on-call to the incoming on-call person. That's mostly how we transfer state. This typically cover, this notes typically covers the context about ongoing incidents and things to watch out for in general. Uh, in addition to that, there is a separate weekly on-call review. On-calls are expected to fill out a very, very short form per self that they responded to before this review. And then on-calls, managers, TLs, and other interested team members discuss these cells as in responses to these cells in the form in the review meeting. Uh, we look for patterns and come up with short, medium, or long-term action items during these reviews. This is aside from self-corrective actions or SCAs taken during the cells themselves, which are very specific to the SCAs. We also have a company-wide tool called as Houston, which is part of a larger incident response suite where all incident responders are expected to log their hours and provide brief descriptions of the cells. This data is used for higher level analysis and for finding larger patterns across the organizations or the company. Very interesting. Um, and I can see a lot of parallels to what we do here. Um, it, you know, Slack seems to be a big part of sharing context, uh, also, you know, some other sort of instant messaging system. Um, and, and that's definitely worked pretty well for us. Um, uh, Ashley, um, how does it work at Lyft? Yeah, we have a lot of similar things, um, like everyone else has been discussing. We do have the primary and secondary set up at all times, where primary is usually the one handling issues and secondary is not normally expected to have to respond to incidents, but is more of a fall through. Uh, so to um, capture issues that will maybe take more than one week to resolve, there's uh, kind of like two paths here. So there is a weekly handoff meeting that is part of the team's weekly planning cycle. And there's a on-call summary doc that's kind of like a rolling summary that the on-call will fill out and pass on to the next. Uh, for things that may be more like debugging related or a feature request or whatever that we will get in from customer teams using the platform, these are things that we found that our on-call rotation was not a good fit for because it, these things usually took more than one week and the customer did not like being handed off from person to person or things could get accidentally dropped very easily. And so we actually created a separate role um, that sits in a, in a team called Infra Ops that is responsible for less urgent, but probably more long running issues like debugging requests, feature requests, et cetera. And that enables these items to stay with the same owner until they're resolved. Cool, thank you. Um, Ramya. Yep, we have a very similar setup as well. We have a primary and a secondary uh, on-call. Primary uh, handles all the tickets, and if there, is, if there is any fall through, the secondary handles it as well. Uh, this is a weekly schedule, and every at the, uh, at the end of every person's shift, there is a on-call handoff meeting, and there is typically a Google Doc where people maintain uh, their uh, major changes or major major uh, major incidents that happened in the last week, or small incidents that are continuing to happen and needs to be needs further investigation. Uh, we also struggle with what incident needs to be like handed off and what incidents need to be like the can the person on call take it to completion even though he's not on call he or she's not on call for the system anymore uh, we also made in a jira on call tasks uh, we are trying kanban right now uh, uh, this is a list of low priority tickets and uh, debugging tasks requests that come during the week uh, uh, on call pro probably doesn't have bandwidth for this and there is a separate rotation bug rotation for to look at these tickets and triage these tickets and like take it to completion yeah, and I will add that the bug rotation is actually a great way for people to onboard onto the on-call rotation because um, you know it allows people to tackle on-call-like tasks without the time pressure of being in an incident. Uh, Fabio, I think this will be a bit boring. It's very, very similar to everything that's been said. Um, we also run weekly handoff meetings, and we use a rolling document. Uh, primary fills that document. I think one thing that's maybe unique, not super unique, I've heard that before uh, from other panelists, is that. We merge support, on-call, incident response, um, monitoring, all of that. The, it's, it's part of our on-call rotation. So all the responsibilities are combined. And 
we make sure we go through all that in our handoff meetings. Um, we it's very organic, I would say, on Netflix is that part of our freedom and responsibility culture. So we lean a lot on the individuals in a lot of cases. For example, between primary and secondary, we don't have a lot of rules or, or structure on how they will handle the load. It's up to them to divide and load balance the load as needed. Primary is always expected to be um, responsible for initiating all of it, but primary also needs to pull others as necessary. Um, aspirationally, we want everyone in the on call to be to have be comfortable with the huge surface area for everything. We know in reality there's always a little bit of a specialization, so we try and balance that. Too. Primary is responsible for balancing that, um, pulling others as necessary, especially when there's specialization necessary. Um, another thing that's maybe a little bit unique in what we do, I haven't heard before, we spend time in our handover talking about the health of the on call. Um, so we, we, we use a template and we always make sure we talk about how much time people spending handling pages, off hours, how much risk they, that was perceived on the system, what's their qualitative assessment of uh, how was the shift. And it's just prompts for us to make sure that we talk about those things, they're not brushed off. And we make so heavy health on, healthy on call this is high priority for us all the time. Yeah, that's a that's a great call out. Thanks, Fabio. Um, yeah, on call is is definitely a very stressful um, and anxiety inducing activity, um, and and that's actually a nice segue into the next question, um, which is uh, one of the conversations I have frequently when people join our team, um, especially if they come from a team that you know is it a smaller company with a little bit less responsibility or you know smaller clusters, um, <clears throat> is just a lot of kind of uncertainty and anxiety about joining on call. Um, Kubernetes is a big surface area, as we've mentioned a couple of times today. Uh, people who are new to the technology or the team are often concerned about the, the, their lack of experience and comprehensive knowledge um, and not being able to help when there is an incident. Um, so I'd love to hear how you all prepare new people to join the on-call rotation um, and get them ramped up. Um, let's start with Fabio. I think we're still learning. Um, what we're trying, and it, it's been working relatively well, but we're still evolving this. Uh, it's not it's not great for people that join. It's a huge surface area, like you're saying. So we're, yeah, managing the situation, I would say. Um, we do onboarding sessions and workshops. We recorded a bunch of those. Uh, that's ranging from day to day. How do you? What tooling do you use to get to troubleshoot things and to uh, gather operational data so you can trace what's going on? Um, ranging from that to higher level architecture onboarding sessions on how things plug together, how they work, what what are the interactions on the systems, where are the hotspots. Um, we also Typically, new members will shadow other on calls um, at least once, but multiple times, even multiple. They will just um, add themselves to the rotation, and they will pair up on on any issues and questions and support that happens. Um, so that helps build confidence as well. Uh, and the opposite, during their first or second shift, they're doing cup, in the beginning when they're starting to, to get into the on call rotation, they will ask others, more experienced members, to shadow them as well. To have a buddy. Um, and yeah, uh, we have run books, um, though, as you may agree or disagree, I don't know, but keeping run books is always a challenge. Keep, keeping run books up to date is always a challenge. Um, we do have run books. We talk about them during handoffs. Um, and being very supportive as a team, I think it's important for us. We know it's a huge surface area. Um, it can take, I don't know, up to the, it can take three to six months for a member typically to feel confident joining your own call rotation. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we usually wait at least three months for someone to join the team before they start preparing to join the on-call rotation. Um, and I often tell people when they join a team like ours, that it's like, you know, you should expect to feel like you, you st you're still figuring things out for probably the first year. Um, there's just a lot to, to handle. Um, let's hear about Lyft. Yeah, so this is also very difficult. Um, operating Kubernetes like involves massive surface area and then also like massive risk to the organization since if something goes wrong at this layer, it's going to be pretty severe, um, if not handled appropriately. So this is something where we find it's it's pretty challenging to do this correctly in terms of you know bringing people on board uh, while minimizing risk uh, to the company, particularly with very junior team members. However, we did recently uh, successfully add a new grad or entry level um, person to our rotation and it's been going great. She's doing great. And so it can be done. Um, we find that we have the most success by, um, starting with shadowing. And so we'll have new team members shadow a primary on-call, meaning that 
they're, they receive pages, um, but aren't expected to be responsible for triaging, but just following along and asking questions. Um, after they're done with one or two shadowing sessions, then they will do reverse shadowing in which they and an experience on caller will be paged. Um, and the new person is now responsible for trying to triage, but there's backup where there's someone there who can help them if they get stuck. Um, and then only after they have completed one or two of those and it's gone well, we will introduce them into the rotation. Something we've found is that no one ever is going to feel ready enough uh, when they are put into the rotation. It's a bit of a trial by fire. And so it's more about thinking about ensuring that they know where to look and how to get help in the event that something happens they don't know how to handle. Um, and so that they can kind of learn on the job while not compromising our production safety. Absolutely. And, and I think that's just the nature of on-call. Like it's never predictable because if it was predictable, ideally you would have automated that edge case away or that, you know, that scenario away. So um, yeah, definitely challenging. Um, Ramya, what's going next? Yeah, we have, we have the same issues as everyone else has. Uh, one thing we do is we have a lot of code, we have a lot of different code bases and we typically let the first on, let the new body, new hire uh, create a cluster, which would involve creating uh, PRs across multiple repos and learn the paths that change or get created during cluster creation. Uh, we also we also have video recordings of uh, past presentations of different components of Kubernetes. So uh, these videos are recorded and is in some Google Drive. And uh, the typically new hire goes and watches all these videos and then have a session have a session where they ask questions about various sub components of the Kubernetes. Uh, uh, then they get to become secondary on call first and handle all the low priority tickets and uh, and uh, all the Jira tasks that come in as part of uh, as part of that rotation. Uh, finally, they become primary on call when they are comfortable. And uh, typically, every new hire has a new hire buddy. So the new hire buddy and the new hire typically joins and uh, collaborates basically for the first shift and get, they get a lot of help from the body uh, as well as other team members and uh, that helps them tide over the first on call um we all, we we have we have run books we hope to keep them up to date it's a cat and mouse game every every now and then something goes off in the script and has to be up has to be up, updated retroactively we also expect alerts to have clear instructions again that that also changes, so it's a uh, it's again a cat and mouse game. And then dashboards, the same case. Like after every incident, I find another metric that's super useful and add it to the dashboard. So dashboards are super useful to triage on call issues. So um, uh, we just have a list of dashboards uh, in a documentation that helps the on call. Um, we also have fire drills, and uh, every now and then, every Wednesday, we typically have a fire drill that hopefully helps the new hire as well. During large scale events, uh, the on call is not expected to be alone. Most of the time, few experienced team members just log in, uh, jump into the Slack uh, uh, channel that is specific to that particular incident, and uh, it's all hands on deck when there's an incident. Uh, on call, never, I don't think on call ever feels alone handling large scale incidents. Thanks, Ramya. Uh, and finally, um, Madhu. Yeah, our experience is some, very similar to what others said. In fact, this has been one of our biggest people challenges right now. While huge surface area and familiarity with the technology are certainly challenging, people also come in with varied levels of incident response experience. Previously, after three to four months of starter tasks that included SEAs and startup projects mentored by an onboarding buddy, we would ask new members to do a shadow shift and a reverse shadow shift and ask them to go on call. That was proven to be insufficient as we grow and hire people with different levels of experience and familiarity. We have run books, but many incidents are like mystery thrillers. Thriller is the operative words because it requires some heroism from someone who knows something about a specific technology many times. So due to that, this is all due to the complexity of the technologies involved, which require us to deep dive, even to mitigate the incidents, right? Not just root cause. So we are working on revamping our onboarding process right now. We are planning to introduce a curriculum for new team members to facilitate structured self-paced learning, something like what Ramya was saying about re recorded videos. We haven't done that yet. We are working on them right now. Um, more recently, we started running team-wide game day exercises, deep dives on different areas from subject matter experts. Uh, now we even provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for people who are less confident and give people opportunities to go through multiple rounds of shadows and reverse shadows for both service desk and incident response rotations. If, if they ask for, some people are confident, some people are not. So depending on the level of confidence, we give the opportunities. 
Wonderful. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've never heard incidents uh, uh, described as a mystery thriller, a thriller, but that definitely makes a lot of sense. And there's a certain sense of satisfaction once you figure out what the root cause was. Um, it's often hard to understand what's going on with a Kubernetes cluster when something does misbehave. Uh, for example, we, we've certainly experienced this where a misbehaving client can easily degrade the performance of the control plane. Um, what tools work well to get observability into what's happening with your cluster? And do you use any out-of-band tools to share context as changes are made um, by engineers at the company to try and understand what might have caused an issue with the cluster? Um, let's start with uh, Madhup. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting and long-winded one. Um, we use Prometheus plus Grafana for metrics, Vector plus Humio for logging, not just for Kubernetes components. Obviously, Kubernetes exposes some of these things, but also for the extensions that we build. And we expect all the clients that run on our system to have some, at least in in house clients, to have some level of uh, monitoring, logging, et cetera. Distributed tracing is slowly being added to core Kubernetes components right now. So because there was no good prior art, we haven't done a lot of tracing for, for our Kubernetes extensions. Applications do have, you have them and use them heavily though. Uh, but that said, um, we have a block, black box monitoring running against our clusters all the time. We call them as possessions and they run frequently depending on where they're running and what exact set of tests they're running. Um, but despite all these, we have been in cells where none of them have given us the full story or the full picture. Um, we had to get the DCP down, read through IP tables, and then deep dive into the code itself to even mitigate. Um, so there are all those challenges. But in addition, we are trying to train the team on all the tools that we think we might use during these incidents and the tools that we have used during the incident so that everybody's familiar with the tooling, at least, so that they can use it when, when it's required. Um, in addition to that, we are also building a CD system, which we internally call as platform CD, optimized for infrastructure change management. Um, we are building visibility features into the system to understand the changes that go into the system quickly across the board, as in not just the changes rolled out by my team, but all the high, other high-touch teams that are building operators against the system. So hopefully that will give us the visibility we need to understand the changes that go into the system. Fascinating. So there's, there's a lot to it um, is the sort of summary there, which is uh, lots of different systems, lots of different ways to try and figure out what is going on with the cluster. Um, um, let's go to Fabio um, and talk about Netflix. Um, I personally love the CLI and a lot of people in my team do as well. So we use kubectl, jq, kubectx a lot. Um, we build tooling scripts, set hot scripts on top of it. Um, also, I found having we found in my team having an ability to blast SSH, even though we hate we don't we don't love doing that. It's always very, very good to have that escape hatch. Um, so blast SSH, parallel SSH is also important. Um, we have so our observability tooling mostly predates Kubernetes. So we already had observability before we introduced Kubernetes. So instead of using Kubernetes native double quote um, observability, we try to plug whatever we have into Kubernetes. And we mostly do that from a combination of writing our own exporters or using open telemetry these days, hotel collectors. Either we contribute our own custom collectors or we use what's available there. Uh, those collectors and slurpers are, are pulling all the operational data like logs, tracing metrics, and forwarding them to our in-house um, observability tooling, which is a combination of Atlas, our open source time series database, and we um, complement Atlas with indexing. Uh, we use a lot of ELK, Elasticsearch Kibana, uh, oh. for indexing various things, ranging from logs to state transitions, events from the clusters. And we also complement that with a big, big data style um, data uh, archival and querying capabilities. Both of those indexing and big data is very valuable for us for ad hoc querying as well. Um, we often get to the case where we don't have the metrics that we needed to troubleshoot something. We'll add the metrics, but we also have the ability to look back at what, what happened. That's invaluable to us. We also we also found it very, very helpful to write plugins to Cube Scheduler to add more tracing data, especially on scheduling decisions. Uh, our experience is that the pod, inf the information about scheduling failures that's in the pod, it's good, but you have no history and it's often very hard to understand why things are not getting scheduled. So we also added a bunch of extra telemetry there. Wonderful. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, let's go to Ramya. Um, so we, we, we have metrics, we scrape all the Prometheus endpoints that is available and then pop that to our, uh, 
uh, uh, pumped up to our metrics provider, and then uh, and then we have logging. We have a similar ELK setup that collects all the logs from all the systems and uh, make it available through Kibana. Um, we have dashboards, and during every incident, I figure out a new metric that is super useful that was not previously there in the dashboard. A dashboard can have only like 50 or 60 metrics. I mean, it becomes unreadable. But after every incident, I'm like, oh, this metric is super useful, and I keep adding them to the dashboard. Um, so that go the same goes with scheduling, scheduler, control plane, and Kubernetes API server. Kubernetes API server being a huge metrics. It's like an amount of metrics that is given out by Kubernetes API server is a lot, and uh, we pick and choose only ones that matter. Uh, events are super critical for us. Uh, why did a pod get killed? Why did a pod get? Uh, uh, why did a pod get evicted? Why did a scheduling fail? All of that gets pumped as metrics uh, as events, and we look through. I look through events log, event logs all the time to figure out why scheduling failed, or why a pod got killed, or why we rotated a node and stuff like that. Um, so events are super super useful uh, during large scale incidents. Uh, we hope to have everything scripted out and have a runbook for like rotating nodes or rotating, uh, rotating all deployments and stuff like that. But I invariably pick up kubectl, write my own for while loop during incidents to handle handle the, because there's slight variation. I only want to filter out all these deployments that have this characteristic and then do something to that set of deployments. So I invariably go back to shell and, and shell and uh, try to change the state of the system to handle incidents. So. Um, yeah, uh, that's been our experience handling incidents. And... Thanks, Ramya. Cool. Ashley, tell us about Lyft. Yeah, so we also have an in-house stats pipeline that is uh, collecting up and aggregating um, in cluster Prometheus stats, similar thing for logging, where they're collected up and shipped to central Kibana. Uh, we do have uh, and rely a lot on dashboards and alarms. And as part of our weekly on-call um, handoff process, there's tuning um, and backtesting that happens to ensure that these alarms are really useful and not just being noisy. Um, we also rely on an in-house canary service that's kind of similar to the assertions things, just running into end tests continuously, covering functionality that is essential for operating lift services and paging us if it cannot complete it. Um, for operational tooling, Lyft has open sourced a project called Clutch that exposes um, sort of these like critical incident response actions such as coordinating a node, debugging uh, or like pulling debug logs from Envoy or terminating pods, et cetera, um, in a web UI. Um, so we rely on that to respond to things um, and also enable others to kind of self-help like a service owner can coordinate a node if they you know notice it's an issue before the compute on call is, is available. Um, and that way like we can improve that sort of like time to mitigation. Um, and then in terms of how we um, like handle misbehaving clients, we do try to, as I mentioned earlier, limit the usage of operators and then also isolate these uh, operators and CRDs onto clusters where their blast radius is, is limited. Uh, one thing that we've built that we find very useful is we build a large like collection of these really small operational tools or like self-healing assistance tools uh, for Kubernetes, because a lot of times we'll notice that Kubernetes will kind of get itself into this terminal state that isn't really what is expected by the service owner. For example, like uh, you might get a failed create pod sandbox and like that's just the end for Kubernetes and it just leaves it there and will never retry, which isn't really what the service owner wants. They just want their workload to like run somewhere. And so we have like a little controller that like will watch for things like this and just like terminate the thing for the node, et cetera, um, so that this will, just go somewhere else, schedule and be successful like the service owner expects. Um, when we think about these little tools and how we build them, one of the principles that we follow is simplicity uh, because these are like uh, things that we want to prevent or help respond to incidents. We want don't want like any incidents with these tools themselves. And so if you build like a giant Rube Goldberg machine that's like managing and trying to do all the ma magic on your infrastructure, you're like going to get into trouble fairly easily. Um, and like if something goes wrong with these things, it'll be really hard to figure out what went wrong. Uh, so we try to make these things as simple as possible, where these services, like the thing that goes and kills the pod sandbox, sandbox there, so that's a separate tool. The thing that coordinates, coordinates nodes, that's a separate tool. So there's these really basic, simple controllers, um, but they should be dead simple and then just work to make things aggregate better, hopefully. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing today. Uh, it's always really interesting to see what, what's worked for everyone, what hasn't, um, so that we can all learn from each other. I've certainly learned a few things today. 
Um, thank you all for your time today, and I wish you the quietest of on-call weeks going forwards. Thanks, everyone.